Good afternoon. I'm uh, John Glad Castello, farmer from Crockett County. And uh, my honor this afternoon is to introduce the next panel on uh, Vietnam veterans. I'm going to talk first about uh, the three veterans that you're uh, going to hear from this afternoon. I'd like to identify some of the things that are common to all of them. First off, they come from rural America. They come from the farms. They come from the 16 percent of this nation's citizens that constitute, by some estimates, 40 percent of those who serve in our great nation. 40% from 16%. They reflect the values of that rural environment, of hard work, dedication, self-sacrifice, and a willingness to serve. They also have in common that they have degrees in agriculture, they went to the University of Tennessee at Martin, and they were in the fraternity Alpha Gamma Rho. Each of the three were members of the Army Reserve Officer Training Corps, or ROTC, at Martin, and they were commissioned in branches that are known in the military as being combat arms. Infantry, engineers, tanks and tracks, artillery. Bill Powell on the end, when he was at Martin, he demonstrated the strengths of character that later would keep him strong as he met some terrible challenges. Took him four times, or three and a half, to pledge and become an active in uh, AGR. He was a walk on on the football team and eventually got a full scholarship. He was commissioned in artillery, went to Fort Seal, follow on tour in Vietnam. And his job was as a forward observer, which meant he went with the infantry. And whenever they got into contact, they hollered for him to bring the artillery in. And that was his job. While he was doing that, he was grievously wounded. And that stubbornness that he had shown when he was pledging three and a half times and walking on in football stood him through over a year of operations and, and recovery from that wound. There was one other element that all these shared that I forgot, but I can tell it now because Bill is an example of it. They went back home to their communities. They started businesses. They were part of the leadership and they strengthen those communities that they went back to. Thomas Raines, another rural American, UTM, AGR, all the stuff I said about Bill, degree in agriculture, became an engineer. He delayed his departure to Vietnam for a couple of years to get his master's at Knoxville but then eventually went to Vietnam. And just like Bill, he became involved in the combat and all that was going on there as a platoon commander and engineers. After he served his country in Vietnam, he came back and spent 40 years in the Humboldt community as an ag teacher 
and as a director of technical education there in Humboldt. Colonel Bevel, Eddie was commissioned in the infantry, became part of the famous 101st, was a platoon commander, and those of you that are familiar with the military know that the most dangerous job and the one with the least life expectancy is a grunt platoon commander. He served later, he's decided to stay in as company commander, battalion XO, brigade XO, and as a battalion commander, which is a primo job for an infantry officer. Uh, he made colonel, stellar career, and then after that, decided he wanted to continue serving our national security and helped rebuild uh, the army of Bosnia after the Civil War there. These three individuals are our veterans. Two special people complete the panel. Cindy Kent, uh, some of you may have been with us last night uh, when we heard from her husband, uh, David, and what he has done with the songs about veterans. If you haven't, you need to look on the uh, website and see what transpired last night and what, uh, what David and his fellow uh, individuals have to offer uh, for the veterans. But Cindy, a uh, farm girl from near Cookville, for some reason, I've got to ask her, decided she wanted to get her bachelor's from the University of Connecticut. I have no idea why she wanted to do that. Came back, got her master's at UTK, the other campus of the UT system. And then she uh, worked uh, for the Tennessee, Tennessee Department of Agriculture after starting out with UT. And she has some tremendous accomplishments. You know, as I came into the parking lot today, I was behind this pickup truck. And that license plate on the pickup truck was Tennessee Agriculture. And it shows a barn and some other stuff. All of you that got that, that particular license plate know what I'm talking about. But she's the person behind that license plate. And the barn on there is from her grandfather's farm in Pickett County. And she with Pick Tennessee and other stuff that she's done has been responsible for millions of dollars that have come in uh, to support agriculture in Tennessee. And she is also uh, the biographer and the producer and uh, you know the gopher uh, for the book uh, that they're gonna talk about. Lastly, the, you know, because you know, I'm an old guy and I'm running out of air here pretty soon, so I gotta shut up. Uh, Stefan Moffin, AGR, UTM graduate, comes from the farm family in Dyer County, next door to me in Crockett County. Stefan works for uh, the uh, Tennessee Farm Bureau, and he's one of those smart guys because he handles agriculture policy issues and legislative engagement uh, for Tennessee Bureau and by effect for the great farmers of the state. This is a great opportunity since we're celebrating 50 years, commemorating 50 years of the Vietnam War to go back and through their eyes understand what it was like to be a part of that, to go and serve this great country, make the sacrifices they did so that each one of us here in the states can continue to feel the security and the safeness that we enjoy. Stephen? Well, did we good to go? Well, General Kasloff, thank you so much for those 
um, uh, for uh, for that. And on behalf of the AGR fraternity, let me let me tell you, uh, one of our alumni that we're extremely proud of is Lieutenant General Castlaw. We may write a book on you someday. How about that? But proud of his career and what he has done. And I will tell you from my standpoint and experience is that uh, he retired from the military and came back home to Crockett County and became directly involved with agriculture as soon as he came back home. And it's has a fantastic business. He had the foresight of knowing that uh, unmanned uh, aerial vehicle technology would be the future of agriculture. And he was exactly right and has been a um, um, groundbreak breaker in that area. So uh, thank you for that. Let me tell you a little bit about Alpha Gamma Rho Fraternity. AGR is uh, nationally is over 100 years old. Uh, the chapter in here at UT Martin just up the road uh, was uh, officially began on April 20th, uh, 1963. And so the chapter has been around that long. Alpha Gamma Rho Fraternity is a social and professional fraternity. And the purpose of Alpha Gamma Rho is to make better men and through them a broader and better agriculture. Uh, there are a lot of ideals uh, within the Alpha Gamma Rho fraternity from a standpoint of uh, how the men live while they're at college there, the rules with which they have to abide. Uh, there is no alcohol on the property. Uh, their females are not allowed in the living quarters and there is a house mother uh, that stays there at that uh, fraternity house. And that was the rules that some of these guys set when y'all started the fraternity in the early 60s and they still exist today because the purpose of Alpha Gamma Rho is to make better men and through them a broader and better agriculture. So what has happened over the last 50 plus years that that fraternity has existed at UT Martin is that better men have been made to go into whatever career they decide to go into or whatever part of life that they are asked uh, the challenges in life that they're asked um, to, uh, to commit to, some of that being to go into the military. And our little fraternity at UT Martin has a very rich, rich military history. Uh, Brother Thomas, we don't know how many have been in the military. We're going to try to figure that up. But many, many men who have come through that chapter, served in the military, made careers of the military. Uh, General Castle, I think there were three of you that attained the rank of general uh, in your respective branch of service, if I'm not mistaken, a rich military history there at Alpha Upsilon chapter of Alpha Gamma Rho. So um, a few years ago, this project was started. And uh, the, at the beginning of this project, a lady by the name of Cynthia Kent was asked to be a part of it. And uh, Cynthia, I'll get into the questions. You, you are the one with a, uh, with a holistic experience regarding this project. Uh, you've seen it from the 30,000 foot view. And I use the term experience because it became more than a project or a business arrangement, for lack of a better term, for you. And I would like for you to take some time and just and relate to, the, to you all in the audience from beginning to end what happened and why you are encouraging people to go there and talk to Vietnam veterans you may know about their experience. Thank you. This 300-page book was supposed to be a three-panel, one-sheet-of-paper brochure. When he called me, um, that's what he proposed. He said, well, we were going to honor our veterans, and well, what were you thinking? Well, you know, a three-panel brochure. I'm like, how many people? He said, well, we've got this many, 17. I was like, that's about 700 words. And you're not going to have enough room even to put a picture big enough for anybody to see. He said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, if I, I'm going to do it. And I had just retired and decided that I wasn't going to do anything unless I got to do it my way. So I was really bold. <laughs> And I said, well, I mean, the only way I would do it is if I went and interviewed each one of them. Average interview takes about two, two and a half hours before people get exhausted. And then I want someone else to transcribe it because I'm not a transcriptionist. And then I'll look it over 
and, you know, make sure it all makes sense. And then, like, maybe you can take it to Kinko's and, you know, maybe 40, 50 pages, and we'll, we'll uh, you know, take a stapler and staple them at the corners. And you can have a few copies that way, you know, for posterity. And he said, I don't know. Well, I, let me talk to my group. And then that was in April. In May, he called back. He said, okay. They say, let's do it. And, and then Thomas Raines, who was part of the core group, got involved. And um, <clears throat> he sent me all the names and addresses. And that's when he said, now here's one, but he won't even come to the phone. He's not going to interview. And I've gone to see this one. And he's not going to interview. So out of the 17 people, 14 finally agreed, um, at least in theory, that they would participate. And when you all go home and do this, because I'm going to ask you to go home and do this, be sure that you have a Vietnam veteran on your core team. Um, I don't think these men would have ever talked to me. I don't think they would have ever entrusted that part of themselves if they hadn't been fraternity brothers and if another Vietnam veteran had not asked them. And Thomas Raines was really our touchstone. Um, he was very protective and um, he said, well, before you interview them, I, I want to see the questions. And I don't want you to ask them anything inappropriate. And I said, that's fine. Um, and again, because I want you to do this, I brought those questions. You can come up afterwards, take some camera phone pictures, give you something to go by. Um, and then I sent a letter of introduction. I brought that too, something for you to go by. And um, I, I told Stefan, oh, I'll start, you know, I'll do an interview every couple of weeks. I'll probably start in July. And then Bill Powell called me. And um, there are a lot of things about this whole process that I have no good explanation for how right it went. But the way to start was with Bill Powell. Um, I have a theory that his uh, injury made it unavoidable for him to deal with his service. And I also think he has a fearless and outgoing personality. And he was an open book. Um, we did that first interview and I came home to my husband. I said, this is gonna be the most fun I've ever had in my life. This is gonna be great. And it was just a wonderful, very open interview. And then I interviewed Thomas Raines, who because he was an educator, was the only one who answered the question that was actually asked each time. <clears throat> and he had actually read the questions in advance and written answers. So, um, and that was a good interview. And then after that, um, it started to turn into something else. Um, <clears throat> after that, I started going to places and talking to Vietnam veterans who had never told anybody they went to Vietnam. And that's the thing that I, <clears throat> it's still, it blows my mind. I, I never imagined when I went to interview these guys that they would not have told their wives, their children, the people closest to them in their lives. That's when I knew that for some reason I got to be entrusted with something so important that suddenly we didn't have any choice. If we were gonna honor them, <clears throat> we were gonna have to go all the way. And the stories that they started to tell, uh, one of the fellows who'd never told his children he'd gone to Vietnam as a military career, uh, a colonel, not this one, another one, but um, he never looked me in the eye. 
during the entire interview. You know, and I said, well, what do your children think about it? Well, I don't guess they know. It, it was about this point, I think, after the second or third interview, you had called me bawling your eyes out over the phone coming back from the interview. You said we've come across something very special. Yeah. <laughs> I cried a lot. <laughs> the transcriptionist cried a lot. Um, uh, it was... And part of it, I just, I, I couldn't believe I was the first person to know it. Um, and that has really, that's really tortured me uh, a lot. But it felt special to be entrusted with that. And um, you, you, you're going to have to, you're going to have to read their stories uh, to know it. But there are people who are, Heroes, I mean, real heroes who did amazing things and you don't know it. And I'll tell you, I had an idea in my mind of what a Vietnam veteran looked like. And I thought he looked like that guy in the movies. You know, I thought he looked like Lieutenant Dan. And that, you know, it, you could spot him from a long way away. And I didn't dream that there were guys in suits and uh, running businesses and just invisibly living their lives. Just invisible soldiers who were standing around you, they were in line with you at the grocery store and they were on your church pew and they were in your family and they were invisible. Um, even though they were making your life better, you didn't know about it. Um, Getting trust was sometimes fun. Um, I remember when I went to visit Brother Ed for the first time, he met me out in the driveway, and his very first question to me was, well now, so who are you that you get to do this? And uh, I said, well, I'm Cindy Kent, and I worked for the Department of Agriculture for 30 years, and he said, well, I like your license plate. You've got a good license plate. I was like, well, that's my grandfather's barn. I designed that last plate. And um, we ended up being best friends. <laughs> and Lincoln, he had the best dog. He has the best dog, Lincoln. Um, he was about the size of this table. But I, we, it, it'll be like a broken record for me to keep telling you that over and over I talked to these men who had never told their stories, who had gone on to lead great lives. Um, and some of them were reluctant to tell it. A couple of them tried to back out a day or two before their interview was scheduled. And, um, but by this time, I knew that these men were so honorable that I could guilt them into doing it, and I did. You know, I, um, Ed Calhoun, he said, you know what, I, I don't want to do this. This is, Vietnam is not my favorite subject. I don't want to do it. I said, Gosh, you know what, that is your decision. You are in control. I completely understand. Boy, it's just too bad because you probably know things that could really help other people going through difficult things in, in their lives. And I said, fine, I'll do it. And that really got to the core of who they are. Um, if, if, if they can be of service to somebody else, that seemed to be the key to getting them to talk. That they had given their lives in service and they were willing to do it again. Um, and that was a pretty precious thing to find out. One of the things I learned, and I, I don't know how to get this information out, but I was, Eight years old in 1968, I saw the war on television, but I didn't understand how the draft worked. And when I was doing research, you know, I saw that only 25% of all Vietnam veterans were drafted. Well, that would give you the sense that, you know, all the rest of them were just anxious to go fight in a foreign war. And what I learned from these guys is that, oh no, that wasn't a question about whether you were going to serve. 
oh, you were going to go. But you tried to control as much as possible how you were going to serve and when. It was just a strategy of when you wanted to enter the war, into what branch, could you pick up some skills for uh, a, a job later in life. Uh, and that put a really different spin on it for me, that if you went to a public land-grant university, you had two years of mandatory ROTC. And these guys were at a public land-grant university. And they had ROTC, they got to talk to people who had gone before them, had been advisors in Vietnam, they got to learn about how the military worked, and um, it made a big difference. I, I think that's probably one reason they all came back, frankly. Um, so that was, that was an important thing for me to know that I wish other people knew. Um, and by the time it was all over, we had, I think at one point I told you 300,000 words yes. of copy. Um, one of the things up front that we had told them to get them to trust us was that we would not narrate, we would not interpret, um, we would not put any spin of any kind on their words. Um, that it would be only their words. And in that sense, I am not the author of this book. It's easier to say that, but I am really, I'm simply the editor. Every story in this book is the words of the actual veteran. And this is not a novel that you start with a cast of characters and you work through and it gets to the most exciting point and then it all resolves. Each chapter of this book is the life of this veteran up until now. Um, and yet, because they are brothers in AGR, their lives are so entwined. And as you read through, they run into each other. One went AWOL to go see another one of them, which is a fun story. Um, another one for his R&R, &R, uh, instead of going home, he hiked further in country to Marble Mountain so that he could spend a week with another AGR. Um, so you get to know these people. And for me, it was almost a surreal experience because in an interview, you want to start with things that people want to talk about. And I knew they didn't want to talk about Vietnam. So we started with, well, who was, who was your mom and daddy? How many siblings did you have? What were their names? What did they do? What, what were your favorite subjects in school? Did you play a sport in high school? And what happened is that I would come home knowing everything about this person. You know, somebody I'd only known three hours, but I knew their mamas and daddies' names, and I knew they played baseball and football. I knew that they almost dropped out that one quarter. I knew that I mean, just all kinds of things. Um, and I, I would recommend that <laughs> as an interview tool uh, when you take that home. And finally, I mean, the, the, the dedication really of Stefan and the other AGRs in the Alumni Foundation to, to see this through to the end. Um, it made me want to be an AGR really bad. <laughs> um, I, I really felt the brotherhood and the dedication that they have for each other. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to what they have to say. Very good. Thank you, Cynthia. And you've, um, you're very instrumental in making this happen. But uh, my next questions, guys, are for the three of you. And Thomas, we'll, we will start with, uh, with you on this. You know, uh, early on when you and I talked about the project, one of the main reasons we wanted to do it, because within our fraternity, we, we always preach that you have, first of all, responsibility to yourself. Second of all, you have a responsibility to the brothers who came before you, uh, but also lastly, and most importantly, to the brothers who come after you. So we also had in our mind young men, 18 to 22, who will be coming through college. 
uh, how can we impart some wisdom to them through this project? And it was a major part of it because we told them that we want the audience for your audience to be young men 18 to 22. Thomas, that's, we talked about that. That's who we wanted when they answered the questions to feel like that's who they were talking. So my, ne my next question is, and Thomas will start with you, Bill Powell will go to you next, and uh, Brother Eddie Bevel will come to you last. I want to ask the three of you, what was your initial reaction uh, when you were approached about being interviewed for this book? Thomas, yours would be a little different because you were involved in it. But what was just that initial reaction that you had when you were approached about it? Uh, thank you, Stephen. My, my first reaction to that uh, conversation that Stephen and I had was that uh, it was a story that I thought needed to be told. Uh, we had, uh, and I'm using a different number, we had 21 actual veterans, Vietnam veterans from the fraternity and uh, that, uh, that went over there. And uh, I, I, I had been listening to the TV and, and I knew a little bit about this uh, uh, World War II Museum in New Orleans and I was hearing about uh, how they were interviewing World War II veterans so their story would not die with them. There would be a, uh, uh, a record of what they did in World War II. And the second thing that was brought to mind was that uh, my wife and her two sisters uh, talk with uh, their dad. Uh, he was a World War II veteran himself, and uh, he served in the 88th Infantry. I don't know whether you, any of y'all know anyone that did serve in the 88th Infantry, but he did, and, and they, they compiled his stories, and they too have a record of what he did in World War II. And I thought this was a wonderful opportunity for the story of the Vietnam veterans from Alpha Upsilon to uh, have on record for future generations what they did. Oh, it's on. I'm an old country boy from Robertson County, Middle Tennessee. Grew up raising five acres of tobacco. And if you've never suckered a dark fire tobacco plant, you've never suckered anything in your life. I, my original reason for going to college was to stay out of the draft because if you didn't go to the college, you got drafted. So I didn't want to go to Vietnam any sooner than I had to. So I decided I wasn't good enough to play for well, Coach Carroll to run up to Robertson County to get me to play football down here on a scholarship, so I just decided I'd come down here and make him give me a scholarship. And I started down here in the fall of 65. They were, I'm gonna tell this football story and then I'm gonna go on to the AGR. But there were 95 guys trying to get a scholarship or play football at UT Martin for the first time. At the end of fall practice, there were 16 of us. So he called them pretty quick. I stayed on and finally got a scholarship, but it was only by God's grace that I got a scholarship because the guy I was playing behind was six foot five and weighed 245. Defensive end. He went on to play college ball, but for some reason he had a miscue in spring and got asked not to come back to college for another year. So I walked in and I played his position for the next year and kept my position from that point on. Alpha Gamma Rho, I was an agriculture major. Alpha Gamma Rho was part of my life. I knew all the guys wanted to be involved. The only thing that I missed out on is I could not live in the house because I lived in a football dorm and it was free. So free, 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 you know, the commercial. Anyways, but if you'll notice when Glad, he kind of glanced over it, uh, my pledging time at Back then we had the pledge, and it wasn't fun. We did all kind of things, and I think if I told everything that we did, they'd probably arrest half the fraternity. Anyway, ever, anybody ever eat a large sandwich? Try it sometimes if you've got an upset stomach. You will definitely throw up, I guarantee you. That's just part of it. But the, I played football. 
I wasn't a good student. I was good enough to get through. But I wanted to be a part of Alpha Gamma Rho. They were my guys. I went to school with them. I saw them every day. And I was close with the people I played football with, but not like the people at Alpha Gamma Rho, Alpha Upsilon Chapter. So I pledged in winter quarter, and it was the only time I could pledge during the year because I had football activities the rest of the time. So I pledged winter quarter, and I had a good time pledging. I wound up with a point eight. Took a, what was it, a 2.0? 2.0. I got one D, if that's what, so I had to repeat all those courses. So I got to play football and Coach Carroll kept me in study hall for the next six years. And so the next year I came through and got through fall, played to winter quarter. Hey, and back then we had quarters, not semesters. We went three times a year rather than two times a year. So winter quarter I came back and I don't know whether you remember, Fellow by the name of David Reed. He's from Weekly County. And for some reason, he and I hooked up as friends and got ready to play this time. I said, nah, tried it, not gonna do it anymore. I got some other things to do. He actually came to the football team and football norm dragged me out. He not only did it the second time, he did it the third time, he also did it the fourth time to get me to pledge. He must have wanted me to be an AGR. But the funny thing about it is he said three and a half times I pledged. The half time was that the actives wanted me to become active because I knew everything that the active chapter did. So when we pulled pledge pranks on the active chapter, we succeeded. So they didn't want me in there. They wanted me as an active and not a pledge because I knew too much. But that's part of it. And then I don't know why I got in advanced ROTC. I wanted to too. I've always liked military. My daddy was in World War II. My granddaddy was in World War I. But I just liked the atmosphere. I loved ROTC. I actually loved the drills on Thursday afternoon. Joe, did you like the drills on Thursday afternoon? But every Thursday afternoon, we'd go out and have drills and do that, and I enjoyed it. For some reason, it just felt right. So I hooked up, and then I got an advanced ROTC and uh, stayed two years there. And then at the end of the fourth year, we kind of had to choose. And I, I'm not bragging, but I was a distinguished military graduate, which pretty much gave me a pick of the branch of service that I wanted to be in. Well, the first time I got orders in the branch of service, it was for air defense artillery, which is Dennis Kevin from Martin, Tennessee, got in that. I was a reserve commission as air defense artillery going to Fort Bliss, Texas. Then I got a regular army commission and I got it in field artillery. So I wound up going to Fort Seal, Oklahoma. This is the bad thing about the whole thing. My first set of orders, to the military to go on active duty. And everybody in here that's military-wise knows what I'm talking about. It says APO, no, it said uh, TDY, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. APO, San Francisco. What does that mean, Joe? I'm going on the big water. Said so we flew over, there's another one back there. I hadn't been in the Army six months when I went to Vietnam. I'd been through field artillery training as a forward observer. And then I found out why. Because the life expectancy, other than a platoon leader, of a forward observer was slim to none. Didn't last long. He came away hurt or he came away in a basket. So that's part of it. But as I told somebody, that's kind of my story up to that point. And I'm going to hold it to you. All right. You 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 did you did you did perfect and uh, brother Bevel what what was your initial reaction when you were you were asked about this? Uh, first of all, I'm humbled by the people here. <clears throat> I was skeptical, 
tell you the truth, I was skeptical. Why would somebody be wanting to come and talk to me about my experience in Vietnam? If you were my age and grew up in the 60s, every night at 6 o'clock, you saw Vietnam. It was on the news. That's all it was on the news. You saw real infantry soldiers in Vietnam every night. Howard K. Smith, I believe, was one of the broadcasters. And I forget the rest of them, but they were all the same. Anyway, so I was a little bit skeptical about that. Now, I need to make a couple of corrections. First of all, Cindy, you did edit it some. Oh, I did. Yes, you did, because you took my blip blip words out. <laughs> I did. It, we yes, had to did. keep it rated PG. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and I don't blame you, okay? so. That's, that's why, uh, how it was when they first came and asked me about it. I was skeptical about it because I'd had an issue a couple of years earlier with somebody wanting to make a, 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 write a book about Camp Tyson. Some of you know about Camp Tyson's up here by the other side of McKenzie, between McKenzie and Paris, a little place out, out there called Routon. And that was a World War II balloon base. It was an anti-aircraft balloon base. They trained soldiers and the, those soldiers there were black soldiers. There, it was a black battalion. And they trained them to raise those balloons. Those balloons you can see at D-Day. If you ever see any photos, films of D-Day, those balloons are up there. Came out of Paris, Tennessee. Anyway, somebody had approached me wanting to write a book about that. And all it was, they were trying to get some ex, uh, experience because I used to work there breaking horses and stuff. And, lived in an old relic of the, uh, the hospital over there one time, and they wanted my experiences for a, uh, a, a, a venture is what it was, a capital venture. They're trying to make money off this book, and I so I, that's why I was a little bit skeptical when they asked me to do this, but I'm happy I did. Cindy did a super job. I would not have done it if it hadn't been for Thomas. So that's it. Well, I'll tell you what, well, Still have your thinking cap on. I want to ask you an individual question. Uh, now, there's a there's a picture in the in the book of you commissioning uh, several of your fraternity brothers as second lieutenants. Brother Powell, you being one of them in that picture. And uh, uh, but you returned them after you returned from Vietnam. Uh, you also made a career out of the military. So I, I'm just curious, and for the audience's sake, is uh, has this book kind of opened the door? to you having more conversations with family and others about your uh, time in Vietnam and just your whole military career in, in general. I mean, I heard you talking with General Castellaw about, about Bosnia and, and, and uh, uh, a fantastic military career. So has this book kind of opened you up to have more of those conversations? Well, it has in a way, I guess, yeah. It, it, it has to because people ask me about the book or the Tennessee Magazine, I got a stack of them, I give them out to my friends, I write yeah. the name on them, get them done. But anyway, the, yeah, it's caused me to have some questions asked that might not have been asked, but uh, my perspective on Vietnam is different from, I think, different from a guy that was a Joe Tenth head. That, that's not derogatory term. <clears throat> he's, a, he's a good soldier, but he's a private. Uh, and that, that private soldier, he knew his platoon leader, his platoon sergeant, his squad leader. Possibly he knew the, the first sergeant of the company, and possibly he knew the company commander uh, if he was there long enough. Or in, in my case, with, I went with 100 first, so he knew who was the chain of command. And it, but doubtful that a, a soldier, Joe Tempeg, knew who the battalion commander was, might know who the, the sergeant major was. Something, but beyond that, he didn't know anything. Everything he knew, he got from his squad leader and his platoon sergeant, and his platoon leader. And so, uh, when they talk about their experiences in Vietnam, they're real. They are. They lived it in color. Uh, <clears throat> but I had. I have some different uh, experiences because that that happened over time because I made a career out of the Army, because I had the, some of the jobs I had even while I was in Vietnam. I was aide to a, 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 an assistant division commander, and I was privy to information about why we were there, why the 101st was in I Corps, why we had the 80, uh, 1st Brigade of the 82nd Airborne attached to us, 
So that gave the 101st four maneuver brigades, plus the artillery, plus the aviation, plus all the support and all that sort of junk. And the core attack, we, we, you know what we were opposed for? We were opposed to go into North Vietnam. That had been the initial strategy for years, but it didn't pan out that way. So, but I knew that. So some things like that gives me a different perspective of it. Oh, I got, I'm sorry. You want me to repeat all that? We heard it, didn't you? All right, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, that's basically what I want to say. I've just got a little different perspective about it. I have no trauma from my experiences in Vietnam. I never had any trauma about it. Uh, and I know people that have. I had guys that served in my platoon, served, you know, that did. And I understand that and appreciate it. But all of them that I know were like Bill Powell. <clears throat> they came back and mended. Or they didn't come back. And, and, and in the conversations I've had with you, you, just like you were saying, you took that military experience from Vietnam and carried it all the way through to fix problems, fix problems all the way through. I would submit that our military is better today because of that experience that you carry through throughout your career. Um, would that not be the case? Well, I'd hope it would be the case, but not, I would hope it would be the case, but I can't frankly sit here and truthfully tell you, yes, it made anything better, but I'd hope. But you hope that it would. I hope that it did. Bill Powell, I have a question, another question for you. Um, as has been mentioned, you were injured. Uh, it's something you can't hide. Uh, as a matter of fact, I remember probably about 10 years ago, we had a little uh, function in Columbia, Tennessee, and you came, and it was part of the reason I had this idea. You were just talking about all the, the times in Vietnam and seeing the other brothers and whatever else, but but I know that you, since I've known you, you've been very open about your service, and you have been very involved in helping other veterans for a long time as well. So I, I'm just I'm curious, did, did, did your injury just kind of force you to be more open about your experience uh, and incorporate it into your daily life and also to help other veterans? Because we, we tend to forget there, are, there have been veterans ever since you all served and veterans coming out today. I don't know, my injury changed my mind about who I was. It didn't, uh, it gave me excuses sometimes when I didn't want to do something my wife asked me to do. I mean, oh honey, I can't do that. But uh, she learned real quick, you know, she, she got a long stick now. Uh, I never thought about it after I left because when I, I was at Walter Reed Army General Hospital in DC, the old one, the World War I one. I was in Ward Two, which was the officer's orthopedic ward. Uh, and we didn't have separate rooms. This was a nine, 10 bedroom. We was all in, pulled the little curtains around you if you, they wanted to do something. But uh, I actually sat down at a poker table. We had a poker table out in the middle of it. We played poker every night. And, and I actually sat down at the poker table one night and I was the only one that could deal. They all had arm problems, hand problems, something like that. So I won that night. Uh, but it was, the thing about Walter Reed, yeah, I was there because I'd lost a leg, I'd broke a leg. Uh, and after I got through with a couple of surgeries and stuff, they sent me home for two months of convalescent leave. You know, so it wasn't that bad. I spent a lot of time at home. Uh, and I had a lovely wife that was very patient with me and she took my crutches, took my wheelchair and got me where I needed to be. But it, the other thing she did for me was the fact is that she never let me feel sorry for myself. So if I'd get feel a little down or I'd get a little crappy or I'd get moaning and groaning and want her to get up and go get me something. And she's a nice Christian lady, but she'd tell you, give me your damn self. You know, you ever seen, you ever seen a one-legged man carry a cup of coffee? Okay. It's amazing. The one thing that I always wanted to do when I became an amputee, and mine's above the knee, 
was I watched a guy carry a cup of coffee on an artificial leg walking without spilling it. How hard is it to carry a hot cup of coffee? Period. And I watched him do that, and that was my goal through my rehab, was to be able to pick a cup of coffee up and walk down the hall with it without spilling it. And I do that today. At, every time I think about it, that's it. But no, being hurt, it didn't affect my mind one way or the other. I was a farm-grown country boy with an old grandfather who milked cows for a living. I was milking a cow every day for all the milk we drank when I was six years old. Early in the morning before I went to school. So what I went through, I mean, I don't pay any attention to it. More people pay attention to it than I do. You know, they feel sorry for me. I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me. If I drop something on the floor, I want to pick it up. I appreciate somebody doing it. And my wife got on to me early on because I get, used to get a little riled up when people wanted to help me. When I wanted, when I stumbled or when I fell, uh, I, we were in Washington, D.C. I don't know, one time we stopped at an IHOP to eat and I was on, you know, Long leg cast on my left leg and his own crutches otherwise, so I was walking on three sticks. And I was walking through IHOP and my right crutch hit some water and crutches and water do not mix. So we just slipped out from under me and here I went sprawling across the IHOP floor. I got up, got in the thing, got in my booth and that earned me a free meal. <laughs> You indicated that uh, um, uh, it has not has not bothered you, and having been somebody who only pledged once, had I had to pledge four times, I believe I could have put up with anything too, Bill. <laughs> Thomas, so we're, we're we're running low on time, but I do want to ask you a question. In the book, you are the romantic. There's no doubt about it. You are the romantic, and as I've known you for for over thirty years, uh, going back to when I was a uh, high school uh, FFA student, and there's no doubt you and your wife, who's here today, have a very close relationship. She gave you a Bible uh, before you went. I want you to tell us about that Bible. I also would like for you to tell the audience how two people kept a marriage together from two different ends of the world. For those of you that have served overseas or in, especially as we're discussing Vietnam today, for those of you that uh, were in that era, there was not the uh, uh, opportunity to uh, get on the computer and, and talk to that person uh, like you can today. Uh, we wrote to each other uh, quite often. She probably a little more often than I did, but uh, my memory says that when I mailed a letter from there, it took five days to get here. When she mailed a letter, it took five days to get to me. So if I asked her uh, what color hair was she wearing this week, it was 10 days before I knew the answer to that question. So. Uh, we were we were not able to uh, confer on a regular basis. Now I know that there were opportunities for phone calls over there, but uh, they were hard to get to because there's a lot of folks trying to do that. And besides, it was awfully expensive. Uh, I remember one phone call that I I think it was around her birthday, 18 minutes. Now, I take that back. Three minutes was $18, and it went up quite uh, a much. I think I talked like four minutes, and it was around $75 or $80 for that phone call. So uh, we, kept the, we kept the letters going, and after a period of time, we started making cassette tapes and sending them back and forth so we could hear each other's voice. Uh, 
I showed you a while ago the book about my daddy-in-law. He did serve in World War II, and prior to my departure to Vietnam, uh, he said, I got something I want you to carry. He had a little New Testament. The front cover is is metal. I'm not sure it would stop the M16 uh, shell, but uh, he, uh, he gave this to me said, I want you to carry this with you, and uh, I want you to give it back to me when you get home. Well, as you can see, I, I did carry it in my pocket every day while I was there. I did come home with it, and uh, when I got back, well, he told me, he said, you keep that thing. said, uh, uh, I, I want you to have it. I don't have any need for it anymore, and personally, I hope uh, that no other uh, young man or uh, young lady in our family will have to carry this into combat uh, again. But uh, it, it, it really felt good carrying that, knowing that uh, my dad-in-law was praying for me. Uh, and and uh, he, you know, we served, we served a year, uh, unless you were, uh, went back over for a second or the third term, but we served a year and uh, uh, I was, I, I, he served four years while he was there in, uh, in World War II. And uh, I know he had probably a little more uh, harrowing experiences than I did. He, uh, he ran a mule train carrying supplies from the, uh, wherever they had uh, offloaded them out to the troops. There was no helicopters and no trucks where some of them were, lo- some of the infantry were located. So he, he had a mule train uh, that he carried. He had, uh, I think uh, somewhat, I think he told me somewhere between 20 and 22 mules that he would, he would carry at night. He was always uh, gone at night when he did this. And uh, uh, I, I, I thought that was very unique. I'll ask you a question. Where did the mules come from? Tennessee. Tennessee. If they ever had a mule to be shot, they had a replacement mule from Tennessee. Very good. Thank you. We've about run out of time, guys. I know that, and I think an interesting point. Yeah, Bill, and, and I tell you what, if you don't, if you don't oh, mind I, while, you're, while, while you're saying that, I want to um, uh, fi- finish your remarks, but I want you to tell the audience how you and Thomas saw each other in Vietnam while you were over there or that encounter. Maybe Thomas needs to remember uh, he remembers very well. Uh, he came in and bought me a steak on the South China Sea at the Officers Club that day in Quinion. Uh, first assignment I had in Vietnam was with the 4th Infantry Division. The first job I had with the 4th Infantry Division, which was at An K in the Central Highlands in Vietnam, 2 Corps. Isn't that right? I got it right. Uh, and they shipped me up there and I was just getting my stuff unpacked and I got a mister come to see me and says G1 wants to see you and for all y'all that's the general staff personnel I said sure he says when he says now so I hopped on down there and uh, went in and reported into him he said we're going to move you to Quinion and I've never I never had another assignment Quinion I said, what do you want me to do down there? He says, every afternoon, we're moving the 4th Infantry Division back to the United States. Guys were cheerful. First, one of the first divisions to come back. He says, they're going to all transition through Quinion to wherever they're going back into Vietnam or back home. And anybody at that time was short, probably six months or longer, probably got a free trip home. And that was a great thing. But all the troops transitioned there. My job was to count the troops that were in my place and transitioning from Anke to there. Thomas was the S1 for his group, and I had to call him every afternoon at 5 o'clock to get a count of where his troops were. They could be in one of three different places. And I got that count, and then I called the G1 so he could report to commanding general. And that's all I did. At 6 o'clock in the afternoon, I was sitting on the South China Sea, 
at the officer's club eating a steak and drinking a beer. Hard job. I thought I had it made until I went to the 101st later, but that's a different story. All right. Thank you. A fantastic story, and there's other stories like that uh, in the book. Uh, you, I know in the book you talk about how you traveled all the way over there with another fraternity brother and didn't even know he was on the plane, but you had to bump $20 off of him after you got there because you lost your bill foe. And, um, but there's other stories like that, as Cynthia mentioned. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was a second lieutenant. That was lower than a private. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, a private coming in and going to Vietnam had more training than I did as a second lieutenant. I went to officer's base at Fort Seal, Oklahoma. I went to Vietnam. But uh, I was on that plane, and it was a long ride. I don't know. We went about 24 hours is what the plane ride was. And I got up to go back to the restroom. And for some reason, I lost my billfold, and whoever found my billfold wasn't kind enough to give it back. Uh, so I knew Van Futrell was on the plane. We had met a couple of times going up and down the thing. And we flew into Tonson at Saigon about 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I didn't have any money. I had zero dollars. And the Army is real great about things. They will give free meals to enlisted people. But if you're an officer, you had to buy your meal, even in Vietnam, except for sea rations. So I had no money, so I couldn't eat. So I borrowed $20 for Van Futrell in Saigon, down there at Tonsonood, and we split up, and I never saw him again. A good guy. But I did. And if you don't know Van Futrell, you'll understand why. I did. As soon as I got there, I wrote a letter to my wife. I sent Van Futrell's address. I said, Susan, please send $20 to Van Futrell's wife. I don't want him coming to find me in Vietnam to collect. And that's what I told her. And she sent her twenty dollars, and we were good from there on. Yeah, that's great, Nathaniel. How much time do we have left? I'm not sure. We're good. Okay. Um, um, Eddie Bevel, I want to ask you a question. Um, the book "Better Men" is a is a soldier's story. And, uh, you know, this whole weekend is to celebrate and honor our military veterans. And we can't do that without honoring the fr home front. So I'd like to ask you, when you received your orders, um, what was it like in those last few days uh, with, with family before you uh, shipped out? And, of course, in your military career, you had to do that several more times. But going overseas, I'm assuming that was the first time the family had to endure you going overseas um, uh, uh, into when you went to Vietnam, what what was that like on on the home front? And did you give them any words of encouragement? I'll be all right. Things will be well. What was that like? Well, it was no problem, to tell you the truth, because I knew from the day I joined Advanced ROTC, the first class of Advanced ROTC at UTM, that I was going to Vietnam. It was just a matter of when I graduated. I graduated when I was supposed to and in uh, May of uh, 66, I would be leaving shortly, you know, to go to training. And I uh, knew I would be in training through airborne ranger infantry courses and all that sort of stuff for about six months. And uh, then I'd be going to Vietnam. So it was no question about going to Vietnam. It's just when it was going to Vietnam. My father was a veteran of World War II. He uh, <clears throat> he didn't want me to go, but he knew I had to. And he and knew what you didn't know. He, he knew what I needed to know, and he was an instrument. In fact, there's a 37 millimeter and a tank gun over there, which is, a rep is the same kind of weapon that he used in World War II. I'm sorry. 
so <laughs> uh, he knew what was going on, and he did not want me to have to go as an instrument, but he understood I had to go, and I was going to go, and he wished me the best of luck, and he cried. <laughs> and <coughs> and uh, that was it. He took me to Fort Benning, Georgia, and I uh, got down there on a Monday, the 16th of January of 1967, and signed in at Empster Hall, the big building down there. And uh, shortly after that, my family had, had, had to turn around and drive back to Tennessee, and I was on my own. Uh, and that was my introduction into the to active duty. First guy I met was a guy in charge of the Airborne Brigade, uh, the Airborne Department, rather, at Fort Benning, Georgia. And if you ever saw the movie years ago by, by uh, 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 about the Green Berets, the Duke made it. This guy, is the, it, he's not depicted in it. He's in the movie. He's the actor. He's the Airborne team leader. His name was Welsh. And every time he said leg, he would spit. So, because <laughs> he was the big airborne guy on Fort, on, on Fort Benning. So he, he, he uh, graciously showed me how to get to building forward and I got signed in and everything is part of my history. Thank you. I'll tell you why, when you're pray, praying for, for soldiers today, uh, never forget the home front. Pray for the mamas and daddies and the brothers and sisters and husbands and wives uh, because they don't need to be forgotten. Thomas Raines, this project would not have happened without you. We've talked about that and all the work that you put into it. And you've been involved in planning a very, very special day on May 15th, um, where the AGR fraternity will honor all of you who served in Vietnam. And uh, several of these veterans, as we've been planning this, the book has come out, they have referred to this uh, event as a homecoming that they, they never received, that you all never received. So how, how does it feel knowing that your fraternity at UT Martin, Alpha Gamma Rho fraternity, uh, is saying welcome home. Well, it, it, it certainly feels uh, really good. Um, I can't speak for uh, all of the veterans. If you're a veteran out there, hold your hand up. Thank you for your service. I know that uh, uh, individuals that uh, uh, were coming home and uh, re going to remain in the uh, service, uh, it, it wasn't quite the same. But uh, when, when I came home, uh, I, I flew into Memphis, walked down those aisles from where I got off the plane to where my wife was. Uh, going to greet me, and I didn't get heckled or anything, but I got spit on. Uh, I've, I've uh, you know, I, as I think back on it, I didn't say anything. I just just kept walking. Uh, I wasn't interested in uh, causing any kind of confrontation there. But uh, I'll never forget that. Uh, I couldn't tell you today uh, whether it was a man or a woman that did it. I just kept on walking, and, and I decided that that was their problem, not mine. Uh, but uh, I had, uh, as, uh, as Stephen was saying, as we were talking with, uh, with the uh, veterans and brothers that served in Vietnam, uh, many, of them, many of them expressed to me somewhat of a homecoming that they came home, they got out of the car, went in the house, changed clothes, and the next day they got up and it was just like they'd never been. And, and, and uh, you know, you can't, in my opinion, you can't be in a combat zone for 365 days or two years or whatever. You can't come home and go back to civilian life in one day. You can't, your, your body just is not programmed to do that. Uh, they trained you to go over, but they didn't untrain you to, to get back to civilian life. So uh, many of us that went over 
did did uh, that had or had that kind of homecoming in that you just came home, changed clothes, and went got you a job and went about your business doing what uh, what you thought you needed to do. And uh, so this was this was something that uh, a bunch of them said to me. You know, this is going to be a homecoming for us. This is going to be a celebration for us. Here it is uh, 50 years later, and we're finally going to have a homecoming. And, and uh, you know, I, I, last year we got messed up with uh, that old virus, and we didn't get to have our, quote, Founders Day and celebrate uh, with our Vietnam veteran brothers. But we're going to have it. We're going to have it on May the 15th. Uh, over here at Martin, we're going to have it, and we're going to have a homecoming. Uh, the only thing I would say, Stephen, is I'm, I'm holding it close. <laughs> is that if you knew AGR like we do, you're not surprised. It's just, it's just what we do. It's, what we, it's do. what we do. Take care of the ones who came before ourselves and the ones coming after. It's just what we do. Cynthia, I want to end with you. We're out of time. How would you respond if someone walked up to you today and asked, what can I do to honor Vietnam veterans I know since you have been through this project? It's, it's a two-way call. Um, knowing these men and their stories has changed my worldview. Um, it, it changed my understanding of what it means to serve. Um, and I, you know, the best example I, I can give is that I have two sons and one is still in college and about halfway through this book he and I were talking uh, on the phone and I said you know you need to consider military service I, I want you to talk to General Cavan I want you to talk to him about about serving I think that might be something you you would want to do I, and I, I can't explain to you how how far a world away that was in my mind until I did this book. Um, these guys deserve to be welcomed home. And they're not going to come forward, but I guarantee you they're there. The 14 people in this book, it's not a scientific random sample. But if half of the guys I talked to had never told anybody they'd gone to Vietnam, chances are really good that somebody you know in your family, at your Kiwanis Club, somewhere is waiting to be welcomed home. And I just, um, I, I do think it works best when you have somebody in your group or your club who is already known and trusted. I think that's the only way you'll get them on board, but please do it. And to the veterans who are out there and haven't told anybody, I say this, you know, you were brave enough to go and you were lucky enough to get back. And then you've been strong enough to go on living all this time. Risk this. Tell somebody. You know, it's, it's 50 years later. You will be embraced. We're here just waiting to welcome you home. Just risk telling your story. And I think once you get through it that first time, it'll be easier the next time. Um, I feel keenly now how little I have done to serve my country. I think before I would have said, well, you know, I'm a good mother. I've reared my children and, and I pay my taxes, you know, and that, 
But of course, now I know that that helps me more than it helps anybody else. And that's the minimum. And to serve, to give your body, to say, you know what, do with me what you will for the next two years. I have a completely different understanding. And also, just one, one last thing, is that by talking to this men, I finally really understood why they went. Because there were people who left the country. There were people who let their daddy's uh, influence, wealth, dubious excuses of all kinds keep them from going. And these guys could have done the same thing. But here's what they said. They knew they weren't better. They knew they weren't more special or more important than the guy behind them in line. And that if they didn't go, the guy behind them in line would have to go instead. And that guy was just as loved by his parents, with just as much potential and as many plans and as many dreams. And that's how unselfish they were. They weren't just serving their country, they were also that unselfish and noble to serve their, the guy behind them in line. Um, so, welcome home. <laughs> and um, tell us your stories. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're out of time, but Eddie Bevel, Cynthia Kent, Thomas Raines, Bill Powell, let's give him a round of applause.